Okay, so thank you for all for joining us this evening and good evening and happy uh, new year to you all. Um, I can't think of a better place that I could be transported to right now than the land of sun and, and light, which is Southern California, and nor to be in the company of these two presenters who from what I have read and heard from them are exciting and innovative. Um, I'm deeply grateful to Valerio Miragolli, who was the person who suggested that I contact Terremoto. And I'm grateful to David and Jenny for saying yes and um, starting off our Zoom calendar this year with a bang. And for those of you who don't speak a Latin language, Terremoto means earthquake. So David, maybe when you start, uh, you can explain why you chose that as a name. Um, David Gottschall is a Southern California native. He graduated from the University of California, Bar Bar Berkeley, Berkeley, Berkeley. Sorry, um, and in uh, landscape architecture and founded Terremoto. Je Jenny, um, Jones is from Virginia and graduated there and is now committed to Angelino and has been part of the Terramoto team since 2016. The manifesto on your website reads, we aim to create environments that are aesthetically, ecologically and metaphysically provocative and productive. This evening, Jenny and David are gonna explain how they make that statement reality, I hope, through uh, presenting some of their stunning client commission work and then moving on to more explorative, uh, terremoto driven um, horticultural and land initiatives. They will present for about 40 minutes or so and then we'll open up as normal to the floor for questions. You can answer questions on the chat and Yvonne will curate those questions or um, you can, unmute yourself and 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 just pipe up. Um, we'll, it'll be a muddle, but we'll muddle through. So a big welcome to um, David and Jenny, and a huge thanks for being with us this evening. If you'd like to share your screen now. Um, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, and Jenny and I are uh, so extremely excited uh, to speak with all of you. Um, we've gotten to do uh, a few interesting Zooms over the course of COVID, but nothing like this, uh, where we're speaking to people all over the planet. Uh, so that's, uh, we're honored and excited and appreciative for all of you taking the time. Um, this is our, our quick little uh, rundown. We have about 130 slides, which seem perhaps daunting to cover in 40 minutes, but Jenny and I talk very fast. Um, so we have a lot of ground to cover. And we'll just kind of blow um, kind of through it all. And then at the end, we'll of course be quiet and uh, we want to, we'd love your feedback and questions and comments. Um, so yeah, uh, and I guess a thing that Jenny and I were talking about very briefly before um, we jumped on this was that um, we should perhaps give uh, like a, a, a landscape practice is inherently regional and uh, the presentation that follows and very much like the way in which we practice uh, is rooted in the place that we practice. And so some of the things that we're going to talk about and because, for example, beyond gardening, we're kind of getting into like the politics of immigration and like labor force and things like that, which is all interconnected with garden making. And a lot of these things, though, they're present uh, and of course important everywhere are also deeply particular to the specific place that we practice. So I don't say that as a disclaimer other than uh, a lot of what follows um, is a manifestation of the fact that we are uh, deeply connected to the place that we practice. So all places in their own unique way are also beautiful and important. Uh, so you, I'm sure you've read that, but, uh, this, but this is kind of a summary of what we're kind of gonna go through and it'll probably, it might read kind of wild, but. It, per, it will hopefully make more sense. Let me just interject. Yeah. We're gonna, we have a couple um, generic themes that are kind of through lines of our practice we'll talk about. And we'll, sh 
in talking about those themes, we'll show you a lot of projects that we've worked on. We will also specifically talk about two projects in particular here in Southern California. And then we're gonna talk about three kind of bigger and broader concepts that have been rattling around in our brains for the last couple of years. Cool, so um, we're good to go, Angela? Yep, absolutely. <laughs> okay. And you can hear us, everything's fine. You can hear us fine. Okay, great. Um, Jen. Yeah, we wanna just start off with the land acknowledgement. Um, we recognize and acknowledge that currently where we are, we are on Tongva land. Um, there's also other tribes in the area, Tongva, Quiche, Tataviam, Chumash, Ahachiman, Serrano, and more probably that I haven't named. And we, this is something we seek to do in our practice um, really in the last year, we've re recognized that this has been lacking in our practice in the past, and it's lacking from a lot of conversations about landscape. Um, and we want to simply acknowledge that this is their homeland and we are guests on it. And we want to honor the stewards of the past as we attempt to steward the land. So are you there? Uh, hello? It's okay. Okay. We'll keep going. Wasn't sure if that um, was an interjection yep. or question. No, I think it's okay. Okay. Um, we also, um, another thing that we're trying to be increasingly uh, explicit about is that um, oftentimes when we listen to other like practices speak, uh, we, what, a thing that we feel is missing is kind of like how the office works and how the office is structured. And so we like to be kind of explicit about that. So this is our team. Uh, our team isn't quite this big because there are some partners and husbands and children uh, in the, uh, these images, but uh, our, our practice in Los Angeles is about is 15 people. Our practice in San Francisco is seven people. Um, and so together we're about 22 people all together. Um, we are in large part uh, early, uh, like from the way we started the office, uh, we wanted to make it as non like hierarchical and not follow like uh, corporate business practice models where you have like a lead designer at the top and then everything's like a trickle down from there. It's as, it is as level as a playing field as is possible. Uh, so I would describe it as like a very soft hierarchy, but everyone has a seat at the table and very much uh, a thing that we realized and Jenny and I have worked at other offices is that uh, designers and project managers didn't necessarily have a lot of skin in the game. So thus we've structured our office in a way that's quite different in that really we have, we are an office of 22 small practices that works kind of collectively under like a shared goal and shared ethics. And in doing that, uh, we all support each other and we all help each other. And because it's a small business, everyone has to do everything. And so there's just, there's, there's basically no room for ego. Uh, and so, um, yeah, we just wanted to be uh, acknowledged up front, like um, that we are a team uh, and that uh, a lot of everything that follows all the projects that you see, though Jenny and I are here speaking to you, uh, are a culmination and a manifestation of the groups, uh, of the efforts of a larger group than just Jenny and I. And the, lab and the laborers who sure. build our landscapes, which yeah. we'll get to later. Yeah. And so this is us just hanging out, having fun, being cool, I hope. <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, I'll do early days. Uh, Lower left, in, what does that say? Uh, we'll get to that later. Oh, should we try ah, to okay. else? Yeah. Uh, that's a chat. Okay, yeah. um, so this is a silly picture of Alan and I um, at Sea Ranch. Alan, is, uh, Alan and I originally started Terremoto about nine years ago now. And um, we start, I, I would say that our, our origin story is uh, somewhat unique and that uniqueness has fed into like perhaps the way that we practice, um, but Alan and I were working at a wonderful office in San Francisco and it was a good place, uh, but we kind of decided, we came to a certain point where we realized that we wanted to be able to practice kind of uh, intellectually, conceptually, like on our, uh, like in a way that we felt was authentic to our true selves. But uh, the interesting thing is that um, we, um, uh, is that uh, we started the office uh, not, without experience, but not like deeply, deeply experienced. And um, kind of in, uh, it had always been like in our schooling, at least in the United States, uh, residential work was kind of a bad word. Uh, and it wasn't like really embraced and engaged with in that uh, landscape architecture in the prevailing pedagogy when Jenny and I went to school at least was kind of more concerned with like larger infrastructural um, kind of uh, overtures, like in how we, 
uh, save uh, the earth oftentimes and like deal with climate change and address like really meaningful important problems through landscape architecture and how landscape architecture can address those things head on. Those are kind of issues and uh, quandaries that are still very uh, relevant and present and important. Um, that being said, uh, it was always odd to us that a lot of these like bigger uh, issues and um, explorations couldn't also manifest through kind of the small residential project. And to be honest, uh, we were two young people who uh, larger public projects don't come knocking at your door when you're two uh, youngish people without like a without a huge amount of experience. So to that end, we really doubled down uh, in the early years. Uh, Jenny joined a few years after we had started, but we really doubled down and really focused on the residential project as a means of figuring out who we are as a team, like our values, how we want to build. It allowed us to make a ton of mistakes. The fact that you can go from like a concept sketch to construction in a matter of months uh, rather than years and decades in the public project actually created a feedback loop that was like uh, like infinitely educational. Uh, and so it allowed, allowed us to like build a lot of work, learn who we are and like kind of start to like grow into our shoes or our boots, if that makes sense. That's not a figure of speech. You just, you just created one. Sure, yeah. <laughs> um, but like a project like this, uh, in some ways, like uh, perhaps is unglamorous. This is the existing conditions, but this is an uh, Eichler home that was in Orange County, uh, kind of modernist, appropriate, single family uh, housing um, in kind of a suburban sense. But like uh, opportunities where somebody called and said I had a dead lawn and it was just nice to find ourselves very useful. Um, so yeah, uh, in those early days, we just built and built and then the team slowly grew and we kept busy and we, you know, we'd lose money on a project and then make money on another one. And it was uh, like a really lovely time in terms of uh, figuring out who we were and how we wanted to practice. Um, so now what we're going to jump into is themes, through lines, and subtexts uh, that kind of guide our work. Uh, Jenny and I will pass this back and forth, uh, and I'll start with simple details. Um, so I don't know if any of you have had the chance to look at our website, but I would offer that uh, though we don't necessarily practice under a single particular style, uh, there are themes that I would like to optimistically think that kind of persist and permeate like through the body of our work in its entirety. And one of those things uh, that we're very like kind of upfront about is simple details. Um, we don't like building uh, complex, uh, fussy uh, machines that break. Uh, oftentimes we take issue with the fact that uh, prevailing uh, like mainstream landscape architecture and garden making oftentimes uh, becomes, the garden almost becomes a machine. And we're increasingly uh, disinterested in building gardens in that way. Um, and therefore we kind of are increasingly turning to both uh, materials that are simple, materials that are local, building methods that are kind of uh, straightforward and uh, durable and long lasting, but then kind of applying those like more simple details and still like creating things that we would offer are like uh, formally or intellectually or horticulturally complex, but uh, in their execution and creation uh, can be very simple. Alan, um, once told me, I and this is a, a cheesy little quote, but it's always stuck with me, is that let, uh, let the material define the detail, don't let the detail define the material. Uh, I spent many hours of my life like uh, detailing like stone steps and like, and or detailing like uh, landscape architectural elements that were like almost like needlessly like fussy in which we were trying to impose a geometry and like a, like a, physical manifestation upon like stone or wood or what have you. And we kind of like threw that at the door at Terremoto. And to this day, I feel like that very much rings true. And also a thing that we've, we increasingly have always like le leaned into is the fact that uh, if a thing is more expensive, that doesn't necessarily make it better. Um, oftentimes we found that there was this uh, predilection in like a uh, garden design for like the more like uh, a material cost and like the more like that, that for whatever reason, as the project became more costly, like the better it became. A culture of luxury. Yeah. We're more interested in economy. And appropriateness. Um, and so like the images in, that we've been showing you and like this one here is really, we're working with local stone. We're arranging it in ways that kind of harkens to almost Japanese style garden making, but then we are uh, layering into this uh, uh, kind of uh, plants that can deal in this particular consistency 
condition with like a Northern California coastal, uh, like almost uh, seawater condition. So um, it's kind of a lot of these things are kind of uh, combining in this way. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess uh, we don't like things that are necessarily overly ornate or uh, like uh, complicated because uh, machines break and we want to make uh, gardens that aren't machines and gardens that are almost self-perpetuating and rely very little on external infrastructure. Um, so these are some projects that uh, though from one to another, these are all very different projects and you, I guess our lack of a particular style is kind of starting to show up. But I think what maybe is also starting to show up like in this image, for example, is we're very much uh, riffing on Japanese uh, garden making traditions, but almost in the context of a mid-century modern home in Southern California, and then applying to that a planting palette that is a little bit native, but then also kind of like low water. So it needs very little water once established. So rather we're interested in all types of gardens, whether they're like Japanese or English or French. And so we oftentimes will riff on these like garden making traditions and ways and kind of uh, blur boundaries between them. So, yeah. Um, again, uh, more kind of simple details. Oftentimes, increasingly, we believe in doing uh, as little as possible as is needed uh, to do right by the land, but also to uh, accommodate our clients' wishes and desires. Uh, at the end of the day, we are still a client driven practice. And so uh, oftentimes it's we conversationally identify what our client needs and then figure out how we go about uh, getting them what they want in a way that is like economical appropriate and like ecologically uh, forward thinking. Uh, I'll keep going into concepts. Um, also uh, a thing that uh, a principle that we kind of started the office with was uh, we wanted to uh, make gardens that were expressions of ideas. Uh, and those ideas can vary from project to project. What this kind of idea generation has also allowed us to do is create a body of work that's kind of uh, very diverse uh, in that every project is its own unique animal and has its own set of conditions and has its own kind of client wishes. But uh, through grounding our garden making strategies with an idea, almost like a North Star that we can always push back at, uh, or like look to for guidance as we kind of navigate the complexities of a project. Um, it's a thing that we kind of do internally. Uh, and it's an interesting thing because sometimes it's a, this conceptual journey is something that we do bring a client along for the ride. And then sometimes uh, it's not. Uh, and it's something we do kind of more internally uh, to kind of guide our, and position ourselves. And on the early days also, um, it was a funny thing where we always, we tried to figure out what the concept was prior to beginning the project. And we realized it's not necessarily always that black and white, uh, that sometimes you also have to just start the project and we'll figure out, and Jenny will speak to this as well, but you have to, sometimes it hits you mid stride and sometimes you almost finish the project and then you look back and then you realize, oh, we were doing this for the oak trees or, or whatever the concept like may be. So it's always been like a very interesting journey. And we explore these concepts oftentimes through drawings and collages and kind of like dreams. Uh, this is uh, very quickly, we recently had the wonderful opportunity of working on Sea Ranch, uh, kind of the lodge. Uh, sea Ranch is a, in, uh, is a California famous like modernist um, housing development in kind of Mendocino or almost to Mendocino in Northern, Cal Northern California. And uh, so, in this, in this particular instance, we found ourselves building a new thing next to a very important historically uh, historical building. And that is like a, a, a like an intellectually dense place in which to find yourself uh, and to try and do a new thing. So uh, in this project, we kind of like, uh, we did a lot of historical analysis, uh, looked at these principles that you see on the right where the original principles kind of laid out by Lawrence Halperin, um, who in our field in the United States is a uh, demigod or I don't even, uh, is, a, is a big figure. So how to balance, uh, how to do right by the history while also not letting ourselves be suffocated by it are kind of like uh, things that we like learn to navigate and go on. So yeah, uh, these are some images that uh, we included in our first presentation to our clients that kind of in a way show how we, uh, how we like just philosophically positioned ourselves so that we could then move forward uh, in a way that was uh, right and good. Um, process. Yeah, I mean, David sort of spoke to this in, in terms of the concept and how the 
concept sometimes comes to us at the beginning of a project, but often it comes through doing the project. And um, process has always been a big part of every project at Terremoto. It's one of the things that actually attracted me to come work here. Um, I was seeing, you know, photos that David was posting on social media, and they were largely process photos of people working and have, you know, being behind a computer all day at another firm. I was very attracted to being outside more. Um, Terramoto is not design build technically, but uh, because we do hire outside contractors to come and collaborate on projects with us, but we like to behave as design build and sort of pretend that we are design build. So we're on site a lot. Um, yes, we do drawings, um, but we do not treat the drawings as sacred. Um, we see a lot of room for um, collaboration and back and forth with the contractor and figuring things on, out on site together. Um, and yeah, this was an instance where yeah. we didn't even have a plan. And we was just, we, I was following the guy with the mower and we were figuring <laughs> it out together on site um, and just trusting in that process. And then also celebrating that part, that process as um, just as important as the finished product of the garden itself, because really a garden is not a finished product. It is a process. It's an ongoing evolution. It's the way that we relate to the world. And so for us, you know, we like to show a lot of images of process because we think that um, we find beauty in that. We think it's just as poetic and beautiful as the, the finished product. And oftentimes a construction document can be quite rigid. Uh, and so to Jenny's point about not, make, not feeling that our construction documents are sacred by any means allows for serendipity. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of beauty and power in serendipity. So it's a, it's a thing that we try to build in into projects where we tell our clients, here's the plan, but also this is a thing that we're going to work out together, like right. a lot of it in the field. And as much as possible, you know, David mentioned, we are very collaborative. Um, we also, there's not a lot of boundaries on the projects themselves. So we, you know, different people in the, in the office do have kind of their own projects that they're working on, but come planting day or boulder layout day or one of these fun site days, we will often invite the entire office to come out and support each other. And I think that the outcome, the, the results that come out of that are often just way more beautiful and memorable and it's just a lot more fun. Um, planting. Let's piggyback this. Sure. Um, how do we even begin to get into planting? Um, uh, it's this, we could talk probably with, uh, you know, the 99 gardeners uh, or uh, garden interested people on this site, on, on this call uh, for days about this, but we'll try to do this very briefly. Um, to our earlier points about being interested in uh, various sorts of garden making traditions, uh, and we're fortunate to have the world with us on this, uh, and how garden making tradition, how garden making is expressions of culture and history. And we actually find ourselves in California, which I would say is a new place, like comparatively speaking to like a lot of uh, like Europe or even the East Coast. And so a thing that kind of permeates through our work is a, that I would that I would like to think permeates through our work is kind of freedom um, and like the image that you see here is uh, I guess you could like push it into like a new perennial uh, category if you had to but in a way it's actually not at all in that about 80 percent of the sea plants that you're seeing here are uh, native like what you see in the foreground is Cleveland sage and Romnia coulteri but then like this uh, acacia tree that you're seeing in the background is not a native, but regionally appropriate. But increasingly we're trying to make um, gardens that are as much as they are for the wildlife uh, of the area as they are for the people with whom they are interacting. So it's kind of like uh, a, a person that we admire named Benjamin Vogt, who's kind of a, an advocate for prairie. He's in the Midwest and, um, uh, the United States, but he calls it a non-human supremacist planting design. And we actually think that coexistence uh, is also like a great term to think about the fact that gardens, whether they're public or they're private, have these lives of their own. And uh, Jenny and I live in a uh, neighborhood called Echo Park, but both of our, our, your garden is down the hill from mine. And, but like both of our gardens are native in large part. And so one way of thinking about that is like a, um, What's the term? I'm looking for it. 
Patchwork, uh, patchwork ecology, uh, in that uh, native uh, like bees and birds and things like that don't necessarily need everything to be monolithically native. But if there are there are these islands and reservoirs to, through which that they can kind of move, that that is kind of one of the ways we in which we frame our residential garden making. In that, in the last eight years, we've probably built four hundred gardens uh, more on the northeast side of Los Angeles. I, I want to jump in for a second yep. because I, I think the Echo Park thing is important. Sure. I, to me, having being somebody who wasn't, you know, one of the founding partners of Terramoto, I'm coming in, I've been here for a while. The spirit of um, kind of the global community that you find in places like Echo Park, Los Angeles, and in other neighborhoods in Los Angeles and the Bay Area, that I think has been such an influence on the planting style. Yeah. Yes, it's sort of like vaguely new perennial. It, you know, we plant densely. We like diversity. We don't like big mass. You know, sometimes we do monolithic plantings, but in general, we're much more interested in kind of the commingling and in entanglement of, of plants from different places all together. And I think that the gardens that you see in Echo Park, I mean, you've talked about this before, the kind of horticultural semiotics. It's yeah. like the the collective of people that's here that are here in Los Angeles from all over the world and they bring these plants with them from all over the world so you see succulents from Mexico and trees from South Africa and all kinds of different things all mixed together I think that's been a big inspiration sure. and we riff on that a lot in our gardens while also skewing heavily native yep. so we kind of celebrate that there's a little bit of like a messiness in our gardens and I think it comes from observing the kind of emergent landscape of Los Angeles yep. in a way. Totally. Um, we are all immigrants in a sense, if you could zoom back far enough. And so like uh, layering the, like the, the, that kind of concept, conceptually <laughs> on that um, is kind of important to us in our work. So these are some images that kind of speak to um, how, you know, uh, the various ways in which these kind of like ecologically oriented gardens that are both, uh, I, I hesitate to use the word decorative, but they still are decorative and that they are beautiful uh, and I, our clients enjoy engaging with them, but that they also serve uh, deep uh, environmental purposes as well. We like beauty. We yep. like ecology, but we do also like beauty. Yep. Beauty is important. Um, so we'll keep zooming through planting. These are uh, all sorts of various projects um, of different horticulture, horticultural expression, um, while also largely being grounded in region and place. Uh, like the image that you see here uh, is basically 100% native. Um, and so in the context of uh, Southern California, uh, the term native comes with a lot of uh, almost like epistemological baggage uh, in that, uh, like my mother, for example, I had I had to like, it's been an educational process and that she kind of came to uh, natives thinking that they were scruffy and that uh, they looked like the chaparral where we went hiking. But we we find, first of all, that native landscape beautiful, but then there's also ways of like curating it within the context of a garden where you can really kind of like make it uh, I hate to say the best possible version of itself because no. that's terrible. Well, it's okay. in nature, it's, it's been the best possible <laughs> version of itself as well. But the way that you can kind of curate these like natural conditions and control them. Um, and so that you can create gardens that are uh, in a way ornamental, but also native. Uh, that's of great interest to us. Um, and this is my home garden. Uh, and there's a tree house and Fernleaf Catalina Ironwoods, which are native to the Channel Islands. And then um, Pacific Coast irises and atroplex. And so this is like a plant that you see along the coast when you drive in Malibu, but the way that this wildness uh, can be somewhat curated uh, to feel purposeful. And now we're gonna quickly jump into two more specific projects. I'll do the first one, Jenny will do the next. Uh, this first one, Jenny and I both worked on. Uh, it's called Anzio Road. Um, Angela was telling us about uh, the Battle of Anzio, which, uh, we simple Americans didn't think of the historical context of, um, but thank you, Angela, uh, despite it being a relatively dark battle, but um, I digress. Um, it's, a, it's a garden uh, on the west side of Los Angeles, and uh, it was one of the first big commissions that we received. Um, I was uh, thankfully graced with a client who took a chance on at that point, me, or the early days, uh, and who kind of put a lot of trust in uh, Terramoto in that 
it was a two and a half person office at that point. It was this project that uh, allowed me to actually bring Jenny onto the team. Uh, beautiful hillside property. Um, and I would say the planting palette is about uh, somewhere between 40 to 60% uh, native. This is a white sage that you see in the front, whereas this is a, um, uh, the, uh, the name fails me, it's the morning light. Uh, Miscanthus sinensis morning light and Lamus condensatus in the front. Oftentimes uh, we will cheat and find that like a lot of uh, like the more coastal sage chaparral plants that you see in the foreground that are native to Southern California can oftentimes be really activated with the flush of purple or burgundy, uh, which is a color that doesn't necessarily appear uh, often in the Southern California planting palette. So for example, this is a Cerzus canadensis forest pansy. Uh, and again, playing colors off of each other. And then the, well, this would be an interesting thing to speak with all of you, uh, mm -hmm. and, well, uh, who are in Italy, but uh, Southern California has this interesting obsession with Italy. Uh, and uh, you probably picked up on it, Angela, when you went to Santa Barbara, you were mentioning, but uh, the planting, uh, we're essentially uh, at a, we can, a lot of the plants that are native to and are culturally endemic to Italy work well in Southern California and vice versa. So it's this interesting like co-mingling of cultures uh, and horticultures in a way um, in this project. And in this project, there were existing oaks, but also we planted uh, specimen olives as well because our client loved them. <laughs> um, and so the outer uh, edges of this property are very wild, more like the image you saw previously, whereas closer to the house, we made it much more defined and minimalist. Um, there was this existing Quercus agrifolia, which is a close slave oak, and it was falling over. So uh, Jenny designed these beautiful crutches. So now it's very much this kind of like bonsai, like overscale bonsai-esque presence in the garden. And we arranged uh, boulders from like a local boulder source that kind of float in this minimalist gravel garden. Um, this is the previous image you shot was kind of uh, down on these stairs, but we kind of rebuilt a pool. Um, there were existing ginkgos. Uh, a general thing that we do uh, is we try to be very respectful of, of existing trees and vegetation of significance. In this project, uh, it was previously choked with a lot of like ivy uh, and things that were not so good. So this was more of a tabula rasa than we see, like uh, than we're normally presented with. But yeah, um, we designed uh, this hardscape uh, around the pool. Um, the bleacher steps was a process, was a yeah. was a was like a last minute addition where we were standing on site and David just said, shouldn't the steps go backwards also? And then the these ble big bleacher steps were born. So yeah. that was one that we, you know, we didn't draw that. We, we felt it on site. Um, Somebody is asking how old is the project when these photos were taken? These photos were taken about three years, four years in. Um, we usually, typically photograph our project the first time about a year or two in, but really we try to go back and four years is when a project really starts to hit its stride. And we're involved. Uh, we, uh, our best gardens um, are, um, are the best projects that we have, we get to be involved with a little bit forever, um, which is kind of endlessly maddening, um, but uh, great um, as we're speaking to gardeners. So all of you probably mostly understand like that stewardship. Somebody, I just saw a comment. Somebody said, wow, really well established in a short time. We do plant very densely. Yeah. Um, and we've, some people have sort of frowned upon that. Uh, we've, we've gotten frowns in the past, but we, um, we do it because we find that actually the gardens are healthier. Yeah. Um, they do, they do um, grow faster and the plants seem a lot happier. And yeah, you might have to do some thinning, but you need to tend to your garden anyways. Yep. So why not make all the plants happier from the beginning? Um, and in this, we have like a very uh, com complicated relationship with lawns, because uh, in Southern California, they're not really appropriate, but um, essentially our rule of thumb is generally, um, if it is used, if it is of appropriate scale, um, and then we will kind of grant clients uh, the smallest version of, uh, or the smallest footprint of a lawn that is uh, that makes them happy. Uh, but this client, for example, uh, his son is growing up and uses it less, and we're kind of talking about uh, converting this to gravel or some other material in the near future. So that's a, a, a whole talk into itself, um, but yeah. Um, and here's some just like ongoing images of uh, how it looks in various times of year um, and various moments. Mm -hmm. And we should go fast. And yeah. there's 
Jenny, <laughs> basically, uh, as we were kind of craning in a lot of these like larger olives um, that we went and sourced at a nursery about an hour out of town. And these are the incredible, powerful laborers um, who built this project. Uh, I'll really quickly talk about Whitley Heights because yeah. um, this is another project of this, these photographs are probably also about a year, maybe a year and a half after install. We did plant very densely on this project as well. Um, and this project has been lovely because the homeowners have really taken on gardening. Um, themselves. And that's just kind of the most heartwarming thing. They actually got married in this garden right here on this platform. And um, when they, when one of them retired, he became the primary caretaker of the site and now it's his own. And that's just so special to us. This was like a classic Mediterranean kind of Spanish style house here in Los Angeles in a historic neighborhood um, that I'm now blanking on. Whitley Heights. Oh, Whitley Heights. <laughs> Thank you. And um, we, they used to have a, a porch uh, actually right in this exact location that wrapped around the, these Theodore Cedars. And then it was termite infested and falling down and they needed to take it out and they were gonna replace it. And we came and we said, well, what if instead of replacing the porch, you actually pulled your patio out into the middle of the garden and you surround the patio with garden. So we kept the, the grade um, from the finished floor elevation of the house all the same. We brought decking out to this level of um, tile patio that's out in the middle of this garden and we surrounded it with plants. And this project was um, kind of what I was saying earlier about being inspired by the diverse plantings of Echo Park. This project was very much inspired by the diverse plantings that you see all around this area of Hollywood called Woodley Heights. There's a lot of big old beautiful theater cedars and palm trees that this decking is, um, Mangaris. Mangaris, thank you. Which we normally wouldn't use. We normally hardwood. wouldn't use. It's a tropical hardwood. We try to stay away from tropical hardwoods in general. It sometimes is unavoidable. A client will insist on using Ipe and we say, okay, but based on the research we've done about the destruction of the rainforest that comes from tropical hard forests or from tropical hardwoods, even the ones that are supposedly sustainable, we try not to use it. But there was an existing deck, deck and we had to match it. So. Yeah. Um, and this project uses a lot of diverse plantings. We've got natives in here like Hookera and um, the Polystichum, sword fern, and we've also got Woodwardias and yarrow in the back there. But then we've got non-natives like the Kalankoe and the Australian tree ferns and the agave attenuatas. So it's a real um, mishmash that makes for a, a really lovely garden. Um, there's some sort of chaotic moments like in the picture you just saw and then some more kind of clean modern moments um, along the walls. Um, I would say that Jenny also did a beautiful job of kind of riffing on the panorama. Yes. Uh, so what you see here is kind of like the view, the vista beyond and uh, Jenny did a great job of bringing like that eclectic uh, fictional illusory like Hollywood uh, panorama into like the site itself. Well, and this was a project also where um, we, we sort of knew what the concept was. We knew it was all about the celebration of the plants, uh, but then the narrative that you wrote after the fact, sure. I think actually was sort of brought it all together. So if you haven't read the narrative that David wrote on Whitley Heights on our website yet, I strongly recommend you read it. It's Drink a glass of wine. It's very, you know. it's very entertaining. <laughs> um, and I think it, it, it's an example of how um, concepts are kind of always always changing in gardens, right? You can't just say, this is the concept of the garden because gardens are always changing. Um, and it depends on when you write about them. Um, just some process photos. We love kind of the ugly process photos as well as the finished, the finished products. Uh, we're at 35 minutes in. Maybe what we do is we don't do radical. We'll do this and land on labor, I'll talk. Is, can, it, is it okay, Angela, if we talk for about 10, 12 minutes? There's no, there's no, there's no um, particular rush. Um, so if you There's like to do it. everything, do it and we'll, okay. we'll hear you. It's, you know, okay. 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 Thank you. So um, we're gonna move on from kind of client driven projects now to more, um, I don't know. In internal initiatives. Internal initiatives. So Test Plot is an ongoing experiment in community land care that we um, started after getting involved with the community group um, that is involved with Elysian Park, which is like our local park. It's the oldest public park in Los Angeles. It's the park that in which Dodger Stadium sits. Um, and it has a very complicated history of displacement uh, of people. Both horticultural and peoples. Right. Yeah. 
It's a very complicated park. There's a citizens group that works on kind of protecting the park from development. And we got involved with the group and very quickly we learned that the bureaucracy of the city is um, so thick and dense and problematic. And also the city is strapped for resources and the focus on ecology just wasn't there. They're dealing with crime and homelessness and really big issues that are plaguing the city. Um, and they're also their primary kind of botanical focus is to provide shade as kind of like a public amenity to people, which we think is very righteous and should, should be happening. But there was very little focus on native plants. In fact, none. So we started test plot to say, can we just do some native gardening in the park? Would you let us? And, and they said, yes. And basically uh, the context in which we arrived at the park, I just the circle is kind of the halo in which we are working on. There's four of them and Jenny will get into that. But uh, because the park uh, had been tinkered with by people for a century, essentially, uh, the uh, pre-existing native vegetation had essentially been wholly erased. And then uh, over the years, it had been planted with all sorts of different things. And then after uh, decades of neglect, essentially it's a zombie eucalyptus forest. Like you see like this half dead uh, eucalyptus here. Uh, and then essentially what's on the ground plane is invasive grasses. Um, so, and mustard. So that's the condition when we arrived. Yeah, so um, we got permission to do a temporary garden. And this was the way that we were able to kind of pierce through the bureaucracy. It's not temporary, people love it, but we're calling it temporary in order to get permission. And we consulted with a lot of community members and experts, ecological um, people who grow native plants, people who do ecological restoration. And we figured out what needed to be done on this site, given the particularities of the invasive plants here, this annual brome grass and the mustard. We realized what we needed to do was first flush out the existing seed bank of invasive. So we set up a sprinkler and um, the plot is the reason we chose this site is because there is a, a hose bit. This is another problem with the park is that the water, the infrastructural um, systems of the park are broken. There is one lone existing hose bit in the park. There is already a little yeah. bit of an existing. Excuse me, Jenny. Excuse me, Jenny. Maria Sansoni, can you please mute yourself? Sorry. That's okay. Oh, thanks, thanks, Angela. Um, we're basically, um, this is an example of using what we have. So here's an existing hose bib that works in a park that is devoid of any other water infrastructure that works. And we simply ran a hose from this hose bib as far as we could go, threw a sprinkler up, and the shape of the plot is determined by the throw of the sprinkler to make it kind of as simple and volunteer proof as possible. And um, we, um, we like to think that we lie somewhere in between native gardening and ecological restoration. So we're not doing true ecological restoration, which follows strict principles and methodologies. We're more casual than that, but we are also a little more regimented than just kind of doing our own native garden. And we think that's a really interesting place to be. We're not, we don't define ourselves by one kind of um, strict method. We're very volunteer driven. We need our volunteers. They come out, they weed, they plant. There's a lot of people. Sorry, yeah, I've, I've muted. I muted everybody to stop the background noise from Maria Sansoni, and then I'm sorry I couldn't communicate with you to let you know. Okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll back up. Yeah, okay. uh, I was simply going to say that. Um, uh, we see the previous our... slide, please, because I think that was it was. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah, so yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how much you caught, but I'll, I'll restate a little bit of it. Um, you, we lie much. in between. Uh, we position ourselves in between native gardening and ecological restoration. We do not um, adhere to one methodology. We're not following strict, you know, instructions on um, any one way to do thing. We are, it, this is an ongoing experiment that we are doing every day. Um, and we find that kind of um, invigorating. Yep. And um, it's pretty simple. The shape of the plot is determined by the throw of the sprinkler. So the garden is determined by the infrastructure itself. It's not designed. It's designed 
via economy and function. Um, and why don't you say what you were just saying? Uh, what I was going to say is that um, our initial uh, our initial strategy was not necessarily that it was volunteer led or driven, but what's happened uh, is that when we started the project, all these people, local people, because everyone walks through this park, came out of the woodwork and were basically all these people are like, how can we help? How can we help? Because uh, everyone who walks, not everyone, most people who walk through Elysian Park realize that nothing's happening and that it's in a biologically uh, poor way. And so we started this thing that eventually had legs. And Jenny will speak to like, now what's happened is this test plot has actually become much larger than Terramoto itself. And that somebody at USC, a professor at USC was basically like, I, I like this idea. Can I do a studio based on this? And now people are it's reaching growing. out to us. So now it's kind of expanding beyond our our purview. And that's kind of like, I would argue like the the biggest metric of success. Well, like, and it was like the this. original dream. I and mean, when we started these first couple plots in Elysian Park, we said to ourselves, the dream would be if this could get replicated all over the city and if this model of community stewardship could be replicated so that people who are in their own neighborhoods are taking care of their own public lands. We just, we love the idea of more engagement on our public lands and not just leaving the parks to be cared for by um, by the city, which is strapped for money and time and resources. And, you know, everybody's looking for meaning anyways, and ways to ease their climate anxiety. And this has become a very special way for people to do that. In fact, we call our events, we hold them on Sundays and we call them plant church and we find them very meaningful for people. We've heard, there was one volunteer, um, who said that this was the thing that got her through the pandemic. And now she's in school at Harvard at the School of Landscape Architecture. And it was all because of test plot. It's a shame she went to Harvard, of course. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> um, and so now, as David said, we're growing. Um, um, we have a partnership with USC. Um, we now have four test plot sites. So whereas two years ago we had one, we now have four throughout Los Angeles. We are in talks with California State Parks to, to actually talk with them about helping um, develop a program within their um, kind of entity of um, community stewardship. They just, they love this model and we've proven that it works. And, um, you know, we don't claim to be experts. We have a lot of plants that have failed. Um, we've been attacked by gophers. Um, you know, we're learning as we go, but I think the most important part is the engagement with people on the land. And the big thing that one big thing that came out of test plot was our um, realization of the the importance of celebrating labor. Yeah. This idea that labor laboring on the land is not something lowly to be hidden away from view. It's something to be honored and revered. And this gets to our next topic. And I, architectural like establishment, at least in the United States, both became largely dis. visible the hand and importance of the laborer in the last 20, 30 years. And so a lot of what we're doing both in the way we showcase our work and like in things like test plot is actually like uh, flip that those conventions like on their head and kind of reject them um, in a way. This is one of the, this is a, this is test the second plot test two. plot. We're doing ongoing monitoring and evaluation. Yeah, and this is the third test plot. And now we have a fourth, a fourth coming in. Um, this and, month. and to be like, uh, whatever, uh, for one second, like, honestly, the antidote in many ways to like a lot of the current maladies or the current problems of the world is just like community uh, and like re-engaging with like the land immediately around you. And so test plot in that, I think has struck a chord because so many people are looking for a way to like change the world and it's a, the impact is immediate and kind of profound. And this gets to our next topic, which is land and labor. Um, Terramoto has always been a champion of the people who install and maintain our landscapes. We've always, David has always taken photographs of the process of the people who were installing and caring for the gardens that we work on and putting those photos up on the internet and celebrating them. Um, as David said, there's, there's kind of in the past been an erasure of labor from um, the finished photos of gardens that you see in the media. And that leaves a bad taste in our mouths. And so one thing we um, have always pushed for is honoring and celebrating the people who do the labor um, and not being precious about us as the designers being the heroes. And we also take issue with the fact that when you get basically most monographs or whatever finished works of 
practitioners who we oftentimes deeply admire their work, uh, there's a complete absence uh, or there's a complete lack of acknowledgement of the people who built the landscapes. And I think it differs from place to place, but in the United States, at least, and in California, at least, in large part, uh, landscapes and gardens are built and then maintained by uh, Latino immigrants. Um, and so that rubs us doubly the wrong way in that there's like a there's like a passive like systemic racist like quality to that and so in many ways yeah and and where depending on where you are and depending on who is building the gardens it could be classist or it could be different things and so when we do poorly by the laborer who's both building the uh, garden and also who's maintaining the garden uh, we do poorly by the garden its entirety and Jenny has like rightly said like it devalues the garden uh, completely I would argue like the little that I know of like garden uh, garden making and garden tradition making at least in uh, London or and or the United Kingdom is that the role of the gardener is like very respected and the, uh, it's it's problematic uh, in Southern California, for example, or California in a way it is not elsewhere in the world. And so we are almost are like looking to these these superior models and trying to like reinvigorate and actually be like these people who are taking care of uh, our gardens are so important. Uh, and so it's been devalued historically. So this is our initiative to kind of make that right. Yeah, and specifically in Southern California, the, the kind of devaluation that David's talking about manifests in us having a hard time finding high quality gardeners. Most of the gardeners here, it's a race to the bottom on making wages. And so in order to make a living wage, they run around to 15 gardens in one day. Well, what that means is that they're not doing anything. They're, they're just blowing and mowing and going. Mm-hmm. And what that means is that the land is not properly, is not being properly cared for. So as David said, when you devalue the labor, you devalue the land. And in this time of climate change, it just shatters my mind that we don't um, pay people more, pay anybody who's working on the land, we need to pay them more. The healthier the soil is, the more carbon sequestration that happens. It's just, to me, it's the most important thing. So that's a big push that we are, we've now decided to formalize within Terremoto. It's always kind of informally been a theme. This past year, we formalized it into an internal land and labor working group. Um, there's a group of us in the office, we meet periodically to discuss these issues. We collaboratively wrote an article and it was published in Metropolis Magazine. That was kind of the first um, push that we put out into the world to have this, to start this conversation. Um, We've had another article in Fast Company. We are trying to just push this conversation out into the world, um, not only to, um, well, let let me back up for a second. So um, one other thing that our land and labor working group is not only is to to talk about these issues publicly and and, um, bring more presence to them, but to help ourselves get stronger and more bold in talking to our clients and in educating our clients. So doing this, we're doing this to try to start a bigger conversation, but we're also doing it to make ourselves better and hold ourselves accountable. We are not perfect. We recognize that we are part of this capitalist system where people are exploited. We fully recognize that. Um, but we're trying to do better every day, just do a little bit better. And even in just little moments we're on site where we can say, no, no, the gardener's not gonna do that for free. He will be charging you for that. And we can stand there in solidarity with the people who are working on the land. And it takes a little bit of courage. And so it's been a lot of soul searching, but we're- um, And also uncomfortable conversations with builders with whom we have relationships in that I'm a big believer in mind your own business, but also we've reached a mm-hmm. threshold where you can't necessarily do that because poor business practices have created this climate. So like people whom we admire and we work with, we're kind of like saying to them, how much are you paying your guys? Uh, and yeah. having like those kind of uncon- those, uh, conversations that are sometimes a bit uncomfortable, but also revelatory. And so far it's been this cool, fun journey that is not linear. It's uh, not linear. And it's, it, it never will be, we'll, we, we will never be finished. I mean, every time we meet, we find new readings and things to do. We're trying to just continually educate ourselves about the historic, the histories and the policies that affect this issue of land and labor. I mean, we're talking about colonialism, slavery, genocide, racism, capitalism, like Deep stuff. huge things that we know we're not going to solve. But we think that these are conversations that every that we should at least be having and yep. being frank with everybody um, and trying to take care of these people who are doing this work. Yep. Um, and I just saw 
Patricia ask a very good question, which is as sustainable as the concrete you use, which is a good segue into um, <laughs> our final piece, which I'm gonna kind of power through. Um, and I, it's kind of like an internal uh, North Star that we're working on. And the bombastic name is Radical Gardens of Love and Interconnectedness. And basically it's a manifesto that changes every day. It's a manifesto uh, that we as a team are iteratively constantly working on and changing and updating from the first time we kind of like released it or like together, like a lot of these principles have changed. But essentially um, we are inheriting like a, a broken world, uh, so to speak. And so Jenny and I and everyone at Terramoto kind of finds itself uh, in the space of garden making. So we are asking ourselves like really deep questions about uh, how we can make gardens that are truly good. Uh, we, have, we find that like uh, a lot of the metrics like uh, lead and uh, like, sites. Yeah, sites and a lot of these things that whether they're governmental or non-governmental, like kind of these institutional things that like rate the sustainability of projects, we kind of find that they're in large part greenwashing projects and rather than uh, trying to say like, how do we build the most environmentally friendly thing possible? Aren't asking like the deeper questions, like why are we building anything at all? Right. Um, and so to your question, Patricia, which is very fair is how is sustainable is the concrete that you're using on project, on our projects? Concrete is not sustainable. Uh, and so we're in this interesting moment, like, and I'm using concrete as just one specific little example, but where we're kind of like trying to pull the wool off our eyes because we've inherited so much, uh, I, I don't know, we've inherited uh, wrong information, both from uh, offices that we've historically practiced at and in school, and we just started our office and just we're doing projects, but increasingly we're asking ourselves and self-interrogating ourselves as a team, like what are like the really deep fundamental things that we need to address in order to build gardens that are actually radically principled uh, in their relationship to labor, uh, ecology, and like the, the land itself. And we've kind of gone over a little bit, but um, I'm, we're showing these to you simply as uh, because it, it exists currently as a Google document. You can kind of see the iterations and the dialogue that's going on on the side. Um, and we're kind of like starting to get into like who takes care of the garden, um, the use of pesticides. Um, for example, like a tough one in this is we're actually uh, slowly transferring out of uh, trying to build new ground up swimming pools. Uh, we've built them for years, but we kind of have finally come to the conclusion that they're actually deeply bad for the planet. Uh, but then rather than looking at that as a constraint, also we're trying to look at that as an opportunity and, and instead like we're calling it a bathing revolution where like changing the culture around how people bathe uh, in their garden is like a, actually a huge opportunity. And again, to the point of, you're doing a better version of it in the in Europe than I think we are in the United States, but in Southern California or California at least, the culture of construction around swimming pools is such that in order to swim, you have to pour these like giant concrete vaults into the earth that are then uh, perpetually like uh, in, injected with chemicals in order to create this crystal clear water. And so we're trying to question a lot of like the appropriateness of that and why aren't we swimming in more natural environments that could also like uh, play host to ecology. So I'm kind of glossing over this last thing pretty quickly, but it's a, it's a, it's a manifesto that changes every day uh, because the world is changing sufficiently fast that uh, the moment we think we know a thing, we also have to acknowledge as a team that uh, we might not, that it needs to change and be constantly. Well, and just that we're not perfect. You know, yeah. we, this is an ongoing thing for us to strive towards. We still, you know, every week have this conversation of, oh, here's this new project. It's 40 acres of ecological restoration and there's a swimming pool. Well, you know, what do we do? So sometimes we still take the pool project. It's, yeah. we're, we are, this document is um, kind of a, something for us to aim yeah. at we have we have by no means achieved all of these and the way david's pitching this to clients um there are some interesting projects like the one he's going to show you which is that um would you like to have a, a radical garden if yeah. are you up for going on this adventure so not all of the gardens you know andio is not a radical garden whitley heights is not a radical garden um, the ones that we showed you, but we do have some projects that it, uh, adhere to these principles and, and more and more we're upfront asking clients, would you like to be part of this new philosophy that yeah. we're exploring? 
and more and more we're finding that clients will can we kind of like hint at this trajectory that we're after which is building gardens that are truly whole uh and more and more clients are like yeah uh we want to go on this weird adventure with you so mm -hmm. i guess we'll end it in this talk uh our us talking we want to talk to you now yeah. but, uh, with saying that um we're also at the beginning that we're proud of all the work that we've accomplished to date uh we're also on this uh interesting non-linear adventure to to uh, do better to do better and make gardens that will also fundamentally look different but we also we argue uh have the potential to be more beautiful and uh be better so we'll shut up now <laughs> you have like three more pretty uh, images yeah, to sure. show okay yes. Um, but you see uh, this garden in particular has almost a ruin, ruinous quality to it because uh, we kept the existing thing that was falling down and layered onto the thing, onto the garden, like almost a floating intervention in that we want the new garden to be a the confluence of the old, the historical thing and also the new thing. So it's both the past, present and future at once, basically. Wow. So we'll stop there. Yeah, we'll stop there. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, to go back to my first question, terremoto, does it mean something oh. else to you? <laughs> I never answered that question. Sorry, just Angela. Us, I blew right by so just to I, give us all just to give us all a bit of a breathing space, because that is one hell of a, a manifesto. Can I also sure. ask you now to to un unshare so that we get everyone back yeah. on, on the screen? Um, um we, um, I studied uh, in Italy. I lived in Florence for a semester and uh, Rome for a semester when I was a young man. <laughs> um, in my undergraduate education, I was studying art history. And while I was there, I was learning Italian and uh, encountered the word terremoto. I think there's a few dive bars named terremoto here and there uh, throughout Italy. Um, and the word just stuck with me. I'm kind of a word guy. I speak Spanish too. And then when I was in grad school, uh, there was just a moment where it like clicked. I was like, oh, if I was to ever, I never had, I never explicitly had like the specific ambition to start a business. It, it, that came kind of more circuitously like in my life. But um, um, but the it clicked. And then early days when Alan and I were spitballing names, what should we call it? And we didn't want the name of our office to be our names because uh, that wasn't in the spirit of what we were wanted to do. And it also felt kind of antiquated at this point. Um, and so I was just like, what do you think about Terremoto? And it's served us well in that it's like sufficiently vague, but it sounds like it could be like a punk band or a Japanese motorcycle club or- Or something uh, iconoclis iconoclastic. If sure, you're and, yeah, me. of course. And the, the word literally breaks down to earth, earth moving, right? Yeah, so uh, as well. there's, yeah, a there's play a, on words. Okay, yeah. so let's get on with the questions because I think that, um, you know, maybe there are some, Yvonne, I, I, I can't see you. Have, um, have I don't read the chat while we are, I know that you did answer some questions. Uh, are there further ones, Yvonne? <clears throat> no, I mean, I'm firstly to say thank you so much for, well, firstly, Thank you so much for such a, an overwhelming presentation. I'm going to Sorry. do this all over again online because I just couldn't take everything in. Um, uh, the, you very kindly answered in real time some of the chat questions that were coming in. Uh, most of what was coming in the chat was just expressions of delight and enthusiasm and you know uh, support, and it wasn't it wonderful. Um, may I just ask one quick kick off with one very quick question? Um, Slide 59, um, there was a wonderful silvery tree. Can you tell me what it was? <laughs> I flashed past it. Just said it slide 59? Yeah. One second. I like this. I like a specific question. That's nice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Acacia Covenii. Yeah. Blue bush. Yeah. Acacia. Hard to find in Southern California at the moment. And uh, and also there's one comment from Nat Sturman about pools are like lawns. Uh, everyone might be able to have one, but that, is that appropriate? That's a very interesting mm. point to make uh, in that um, uh, I completely agree with you. Uh, 
Pools should simply be community resources. If you're going to do a bad thing to the earth, then it should be for a large group of people to enjoy rather than uh, carrying it with a single family home. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut off your question. Uh, who were we speaking I, with? I don't know that we got the second word of the acacia. Can you say it? Slowly? Oh, Covenia. Uh, Jenny's writing it right now. Ah, oh, okay. Into the. I'll type it in the chat. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. And we, we were tantalized particularly by your um, explaining that the project designs itself as you're constructing. And interestingly, our speaker last month was uh, speaking from the Beth Chateau Gardens, which very, Beth Chateau was a, a very famous gardener in, in, mm -hmm. in England who almost sort of created what we now regard as the Mediterranean style. And he revealed that she did exactly this. She would go to the end of the garden with uh, a truckload of plants and say, hmm, OK, let's put that one there and that cool. one there. And, you know, and, and we were all immensely um, cheered up by that because it meant that, that even this, this, this wonderfully important designer and, and guru yeah. didn't have a fixed plan. It was what spoke to her when she was actually on the site. So, uh, um, so yes, please, let's, let's do more of this. We, we need to be more spontaneous and, and feel the project as it, as it develops. Um, I'm, I'm going to let other people ask questions, please. Um, don't let me hold Thank, thank you, Nev. <laughs> Hello, can I make a question? Go ahead. Right. Um, at, the, at the start of your talk, you uh, um, were very um, derogatory about a uh, garden being a machine. And yet there's a very famous architect in the last century who said a, a house is a machine for living in. So right, right. if I give you the sentence, a garden is a machine for, how would you finish that sentence? The garden is a machine, well, I guess I was derogatory about machine, but I guess what I should qualify that by saying, uh, I think we're okay with like mechanics if they're very low tech. Um, I've, um, because machines are prone to failure, like I, we almost like uh, categorically don't do, uh, don't do complicated water features anymore because we would always come back to the projects and they would always be broken. And there's nothing worse than coming back to a project and seeing a thing that had failed. Um, and so the use of native plants in a way is low tech because once they're established, they don't need, um, they don't really need external inputs. And so, and then they pair with like local fauna. And so that's attractive to us, but to, I'm not trying to deflect your question. Your question was uh, gardens are machines for, well, I guess Echo was living, right? I think gardens are machines for living. I mean. Sure, but I guess what I would want to qualify that is that that the almost the ECPO, which is gardens are for living or that sort of statement. I don't, we don't disagree with any of that, but I would almost say are almost for living for, for both human, for, for, for living creatures, both human and non. Well, the other, let me throw out another way to interpret this is we are the machines for the garden. Sure. Is, uh, you know, nice. I mean, machines were invented to, you know, <laughs> I, I don't need to explain no, this to you, I like but machine, you know, machines make work easier. And part of what we, you know, we do love this idea of like, yes, you know, we shouldn't have backbreaking work, but um, that, you know, it's so good to garden it's, for it, people. Um, <laughs> you want a little backbreaking work. You don't want your yeah. life to be dominated by backbreaking work, but a little bit of ritualized sure. discomfort. Like, well, to turn that back so on we're here. the machines for right. the planet. <laughs> to take care of this planet. We're just freestyling here, I but I like what yeah. you're doing. And I like okay. the, the, question, the question is good. Yeah. And anything sure. else? Well, if there's a gap here, I'll certainly comment on the, the idea that, that, that uh, swimming pools are not really suited to the, the, uh, the Mediterranean uh, climate. Because I know that uh, yeah, our place in southern Spain, um, we, we've got this, well, it's moving from a, a little rectangular thing, such as you've shown in your photographs, and they are a lot of hard work. And we know that if we didn't, if we didn't throw in the chemicals and, and have the salt chlorinator going hours at a time, then it would turn into a pond and there'd sure. be crops and green stuff and, and algae and Totally. I don't really want to swim in that. So no, 
left of it I mean, only would simply evaporate and wouldn't well, exist in that kind of climate at all. And that's and that's fair. And a point that I kind of blew through because we didn't necessarily have the time was that what we're not also interested in is like shaming the past. Uh, that's that that's very counterproductive. Uh, and that's a thing that's going on like culturally, at least in America, where <laughs> I don't want to talk about politics, but like every uh, there's no like room for nuance and. We think that uh, shaming the way people built gardens historically isn't is actually counterproductive. We're much more interested in talking about future gardens. I don't. It's un, completely unreasonable, unreasonable and impractical for Virginia and I to say everyone should destroy their swimming pools. I mean, that's not kind of, actually. It's kind of like the smoking thing. You know, they all smoked and thought it was cool, and they don't need <laughs> know better. You know, but we can't. You know, we can't get down on them for that. Now we do yeah. know better. So. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Well, and so it's more about like, well, here's what we think the future gardens could look like. And here's what the pools or ways to swim accompanied with these future gardens could be like that are actually more environmentally uh, appropriate. Uh, but we're not interested in going in and destroying everyone's swimming pools. That's impractical. It's more about like building a better future and uh, making that future really awesome as well. Um, so. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Yvonne is just speaking up about uh, the, the MGS website has some good alternatives to um, standard swimming pool solutions. Thank you. For we will check that out. Yeah. I'll check for everybody, out. for all of us. <laughs> so, I mean, I think I confess to being a pond person. Yes. We we my my we have a, a natural swimming pool here in in Umbria, so. Uh, um, is it lovely? It's it's the most wonderful thing because it's it, here in in central Italy. We of course we have proper you know cold winter, and if you're an ordinary pool, you have to cover it up and it looks horrible. But this but uh, the natural pool is a wonderful feature every day of the year. There's always something. And you can design around the, the reflections in the water as well, because it's always there. It's, it's, it's so cool. Um, yeah, I, we I love hearing that. Yeah. <laughs> well, Thank I you. can only add to Ev, all of these fantastic. I will send you the whole chat um, transcription. So you see all of the compliments and the and the comments on density of planting palettes and so on. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure everybody will agree. It's just been the most fantastic um, a real breath of fresh air for us. I mean, I think I feel like I'm in the old world here. Um, there, there's a lot of stuff that's on your agenda that has yet to come anywhere near um, us. And so, at least in Italy. So um, thank you for being thought provoking and, um, and inspirational and I hope that we'll see you soon. I hope you'll join us maybe for some of our yeah. other presentations. We will. We love that. We've got some fabulous speakers and it would just be lovely to have you um, along and take, if you've got time, <laughs> which Thank I know so yeah, probably going to be part. It's so nice to meet all of you and see all your faces. It's really special to connect with everyone. Okay, so thanks everybody. Um, um, thanks again. Big round, big round of applause. Big round of applause. Big round of applause. Thank you. Beautiful. And uh, I'll see you all next, <laughs> uh, um, next month. We go to Greece to Tommy Doxiadis, uh, Thomas Doxiadis. So that'll be interesting. Thank you. Thanks so Thank much. You. Buonasera. Bye. Thank you. Buonasera. Buonasera.